Hello, my name is Lizzie Berry and I'm a history honors major graduating in May of this year. For my history thesis, I researched where and how women fit into the Irish Republican movement, as well as how women of the Troubles were influenced by previous generations of Irish women. My idea for this thesis initially came from journalist Patrick Radden Keefe's Say Nothing, a book that highlights various members of the Irish Republican Army, their violent activities, as well as the consequences of their actions. This book was the first time that I had heard any mention of women in the Republican movement, so I was very interested to learn where women actually were during the Troubles. The Troubles are a highly contested era in Irish historiography. From the late 1960s to the late 1990s, life, politics, and society in both Northern Ireland and Ireland were defined by the conflict. In much of the literature, scholars describe it as a sectarian battle for control of Northern Ireland, as well as a civil rights movement for Catholics living in Ulster. Here was a conflict marked by its radical guerrilla tit for tat violence that resulted in over 3,600 civilian and paramilitary casualties. Historians of Ireland, including Ian McBride, Margaret Ward and Michael Storey generally agree that the true cause of the Troubles was a Catholic fight for Irish Republicanism. McBride, a historian from a Catholic background, for example, argues that they are an ethnic conflict, a clash of cultures, an anti-colonial struggle, or a terrorist campaign about self-determination. He believes that Republican insurgents saw themselves as fighting a war against the British state but the IRA campaign was activated and fueled by street disturbances between Protestant and Catholic crowds as loyalists frequently provided the spark that lit the violent fuse. Similarly, Ward considers them primarily as an issue of Irish nationalism versus British rule. Protestants, his, Protestant historians such as Eric P. Kaufman, however, argue that even if their co-religionists were the initial aggressors, it was the violent retaliations of the Catholics that perpetuated the conflict. Although a truce was reached between the two sides in 1998, most historians still agree that the animosity lingers. As is rather typical in many iterations of history, the importance and influence of women on the Irish Republican movement during the Troubles in Northern Ireland has largely been excluded from the historical narrative. Irish women are often stereotypically assumed to be wives and mothers. They are objects with little agency. They are used for peace, for unity, and for the cohesion of the family. They are rarely mentioned in discussions of violence. Recently, however, there has been a slight influx in historians addressing the roles that women held in the Republican movement. Historian Margaret Ward focuses heavily on the women of the early Republican organizations in the late 1880s to the 1920s. She claims that this period of time was defined by female agency and violence instead of one dominated solely by men. Similarly, Michael Story, who focuses primarily on women in the Troubles from 1960 to 1998, claims that the women have played significant roles in the violent struggle for Ireland's independence. The goal of my project is essentially to connect these conversations. I wanted to reject the male-dominated perspective of the Troubles in favor of a gendered one in which women are included, as well as understand how Republican women of the present were influenced by and connected to Republican women of the past. In this project, I traced familial and social ties, primarily matrilineally, back to pre-home rule debate Ireland in order to map out how female Republicans understood their changing place in the movement and the country. Initially, I researched an extensive amount of secondary articles, such as journals, books, and theses to understand how historians had previously conceptualized the Troubles and specifically women's roles in the Troubles. Because the majority of these historians failed to mention women at all, let alone how they fit into the movement, I relied heavily on primary sources to educate my argument. By using interviews with Republican women, as well as new newspaper articles about their violent actions, I was largely able to understand how women viewed their roles in the movement, how they interacted with their male counterparts, and how important women were in the narrative of the conflict. One issue that did arise, however, was a lack of source material. Because these women were active in secret organizations such as the IRA, very few records have been released into the public domain in order to protect the identities of the former members. My thesis is broken up into four chapters that each highlight a different group of women. 
The first highlights the women of the early days of the movement, while the latter three focus more specifically on the women of the Troubles and into the peace accords. This thematic organization allowed me to simultaneously trace the influence and importance of the predecessors on women in the Troubles, as well as discuss how critical women were in the conflict. For this presentation, I will be focusing on a pair of sisters in the second chapter, the fighters. Dolores and Marion Price were born in the heart of a Catholic Republican neighborhood in Belfast, Northern Ireland in the 1950s. Their parents, Albert and Chrissy Price, both shared a fierce commitment to the cause of Irish Republicanism and believed that the Irish had a duty to expel the British by any means necessary. Albert was a member of the IRA in the 1930s and raised his two daughters with violent stories of Republican heroes and patriots who had lost their lives during the Easter Rebellion. Chrissy and her own mother, Granny Dolan, had been members of Kuman Naman, an early women's movement, and served time at Armagh Jail for wearing orange, white, and green Easter lilies, a band emblem of republicanism. The rest of the Price family was just as committed, if not more so, to the Irish cause. Nearly every older member of the family had been to prison for violence, theft, or insurrection. Indeed, the sister's aunt Bridie, who lost both hands and her eyesight when a bomb she was assembling accidentally blew up, never expressed any regret for having made such a sacrifice in the name of a united Ireland. Dolores frequently stated that their Aunt Bridie's condition obliged the sisters in some way to continue the struggle because it validated Bridie's sacrifice, and to have ignored her struggle would have made her sacrifice futile and useless. Bridie's experience with the cause heavily influenced the sisters' upbringing as well as it fueled their strong dedication to the movement. By committing themselves to the Republican cause, the Price sisters were able to live out their family's legacy. They were to become the next generation of fighters for the unification of Ireland. Although they were young and very idealistic about the Republican world they dreamed to create, the two sisters were fully dedicated to the Republican cause. They knew that they were in the right and soon recognized that violence was the only way for them to be successful. Because of this, both Dolores and Marion joined the IRA, but with the expectation that they would not be rolling bandages, tending to wounded men, or teaching children, which were the typical roles of women in previous Republican organizations. They wanted to do more than their Aunt Bridie had managed. The sisters wanted to have active fighting positions within the movement, and they argued with the male leaders in order to ensure their roles. As such, both sisters were employed to transport explosives and weapons from Dundalk, a town just across the border in the Republic of Ireland, to the IRA battalion areas of Belfast. Because the sisters were young, pretty, and had no previous criminal record, they were the ideal candidates for these dangerous arms transports because the British Army rarely questioned single female travelers. Soon, however, both were promoted to the secretive intelligence unit of the Belfast IRA called the Unknowns. Here, the sisters, the only two women in this elite group, helped plan IRA bombings throughout Northern Ireland, as well as actively participated in disappearings, whereby IRA informants would be captured, transported to the Republic of Ireland, and killed. The sisters quickly rose in the ranks of the IRA to become two of the most prominent influential members of either gender of the organization. In order to avoid stagnation within the Republican movement, the IRA unknowns discussed how they could bring the war against British rule to a higher, more aggressive level. They decided that their most beneficial course of action would be to bring the war itself to London, because while the IRA could set off 10 car bombs in Belfast, they would have little effect on the English public opinion, but one car bomb in London would change English opinion to such an extent that British government officials would perhaps work to remove troops from Northern Ireland. Dolores Price acted as the commanding officer for these dangerous IRA missions because of her extreme dedication to the cause. The Price familial loyalty stretched back generations and their hatred towards the British was nearly unmatched. She worked with the other members of the Unknowns to develop bombing locations that were true emblems of the British Empire, such as Trafalgar Square, the Old Bailey, Oxford Street, and Whitehall. She recognized that by detonating Irish car bombs on English soil, the IRA might be able to fully draw attention to the deep issues and festering relations that were commonplace within Northern Ireland. The leaders of the unknowns, including Dolores and Marion, hoped that by displaying the violence and conflict directly under the noses of British officials, 
their demands might be met. After the bombing, the sisters were sent to Brixton prison where they participated in a 206 day hunger strike. The British government only balked and repatriated the sisters to Armagh jail in Northern Ireland after another IRA prisoner on hunger strike starved to death. The government was so concerned about the Republican bash backlash if the sisters had been allowed to die, so they finally acquiesced to their demands. It was at Armagh that the sisters felt that they were fulfilling a family tradition as the Price family had the honor of having three generations of women spend time in Armagh jail. Because their female ancestors had given so much of their lives to the cause, the sisters saw it as only right that they should too. Their relative stories of their accomplishments, as well as their prison sentences, greatly influenced how the sisters acted in the movement. Soon after arriving at Armagh Jail, though, it was clear that the sisters' relationship with food was irrevocably damaged and both developed se severe cases of anorexia. Between 1980 and 1981, both Marion Price and Dolores Price were released from prison in order to get treatment because to leave them in prison would be to leave them to die. Eight years after their botched bombing attempt in London, both Price sisters were out from behind bars. Dolores and Marion Price were the poster children of what women and only women could accomplish within the IRA. They were active, violent, and ultimately leaders of the Republican movement. They were vastly underestimated because of their supposed frailty and femininity, but were violent, cunning, and vindictive members of, of the cause. They were heavily steeped in the Republican mindset, so they were loyal to the cause from the moment they joined. They never doubted their position within the movement, nor did their dedication falter or wane. Dolores Price explained that she and other staunch Republicans had spent their lives learning Republicanism as a way of life, and they had spent their lives being taught that it was such a glorious way of life, that it was a proud and honorable way of life. Their indoctrination into the Irish Republican movement vastly impacted the way in which the sisters approached the troubles of Northern Ireland. Through my research, I found that the women living in the troubles were far more likely to join violent paramilitary organizations such as the Irish Republican Army if they had strong familial ties to the Republican movement. If their mothers, grandmothers, aunts, and cousins had been involved in previous women's Republican organizations, the women of the troubles were more likely to also be active members. Thank you.